Hi everyone, this is Chapter 7, Person-Centered Therapy for Counseling 4500. Introduction. This therapy framework shares many concepts and values with the existential perspective, which was the previous one. Also, Roger's basic assumptions when involved in therapy are that people are essentially trustworthy, which goes into um, this genre of therapy, which is that people are essentially good people. They have a vast potential for understanding themselves, resolving their own problems without direct interventions of the therapist. So the therapist is there, but they're not going to go in there and say, oh, you need to fix this or you need to do this. And then also capable of self-directed growth. So that means that they can and should decide what they need to do next. Prime determinants of the outcome are attitude and personal characteristics of the therapist, and also the quality of the client-therapist relationship. This is an area that we need to be aware of when it comes to all the different types of therapy, is that the relationship between you and your client is really, really important. Believe that the therapist's knowledge and techniques were less important. Believe in client capacity of self-healing so that we all know how to fix ourselves. Uh, promoted the theory that centered on the client as the primary agent for constructive self-change. So we really do focus on the client, hence it's called client or, or person, uh, person-centered person therapy, is because we really believe that a person is the one who's going to be able to do all these things. Four periods of development of this approach. So what we're getting right now is going to do a quick historical overview of person-centered therapy. The first period started in the 1940s. Counseling and Psychotherapy, Newer Concepts in Practice was the book that he wrote. Uh, and it talks about non-directive counseling. So right there, non-directive means that there's no directions that you are going to be giving in this counseling session. Counselors for creation of a permissive and non-directive climate. So really allowing your client to just speak freely and explore their ideas and then not necessarily giving them advice about what to do. Powers taken away from the therapist because before... You know, people would look at the therapist and go, oh, you're so smart, you're so educated, you know everything, you know how to fix everything. Uh, instead, we're going to change that perspective in counseling with person-centered by making it uh, non-directive and also taking the power away from the therapist themselves. Dismiss advice, suggestion, direction, persuasion, teaching, diagnosis, and interpretation. Uh, he did not see them as uh, adequate he saw it as prejudicial and very misused, right? Um, and that makes sense because in therapy, uh, what you tell them doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to do. But if they themselves are making these decisions, it's more likely that they will follow it or take it. Avoided sharing a great deal about themselves with a the client. So non self, self-disclosure was not a thing. Focus on reflecting and clarifying the verbal and nonverbal communication. So when they talk, you're going to clarify, clear it up a little bit as they talk, because most likely they're going to say something that is very similar, but they need to hear it from someone else, their interpretation of it, or their, their what they are um, hearing from the client. Second period is the 1950s called client-centered therapy. He renamed his theory to client-centered therapy at this time, moved from clarification of feelings to focus on the phenomenological world of the client. And basically that means it's like their own interpretation of this world, their subjective world, how they see themselves, how they interpret the world. Best directions come from understanding how people behave from their own internal frame of reference. Yeah, so you understand why a person behaved or did the things that they did when they explained and justified why they did it, right? So that's what that's saying. And believed in actualizing tendency as a motivation for change. So actualizing tendency is basically trying to be uh, or try to reach the goal that you have set for yourself. What is the final destination if you had to pick a place to go where would you like your life to be, right? So it's believing in that you can do that. And that's the reason why you're going to change and, and change your behaviors is because you do want to get to this specific location or this specific destination. The third period was in the late 1950s, and he wrote a book called On Becoming a Person. Becoming the self that one truly is, similar to what Kierkegaard said earlier in the previous chapter in Existential Therapy, is about the openness to experience, trust in your own experiences, 
internal locus of evaluation. So when you make your judgments, it's making it from the inside of you. You're not basing it on other people's opinions or, or, or judgments or values. You should come from, it should come from the inside of you, right? Which is an internal locus, like location or, or, or place where you find it. It's the evaluation that's inside you. Willingness to be in the process, which is growing. So understanding that um, there's a whole uh, a process or, or a developmental connection to all of this that you're doing. That you're going to go through all these little experiences to become who you're going to be. That actualizing tendency that we talked about earlier. Begin research on the process and outcomes of psychotherapy. In the fourth period, it's the 1980s to the 1990s, expanded this idea of client-centered therapy or person-centered therapy into education, couples and family uh, counseling, industry, which is basically like work, uh, groups, conflict resolution, politics, and the search for world peace. Shifted to the term of person-centered approach or person-centered therapy, which is what we call it today. But you'll hear it called Rogerian therapy, although he said uh, we're talking about client-centered, not therapist-centered, so don't call it be that, or call it that. Um, and then again, it became client-centered, and now it's known as person-centered. Existentialism and humanism, so the reasons why they're similar is that they share a respect for the client's subjective experience. So how they see the world, how they experience the world is where we're going to start, right? Uniqueness and individuality of each client. Trust in the capacity of the client to make positive and constructive conscious choices. So let's say that again. Trust in the capacity of the client to make positive and constructive conscious uh, choices. So what that's saying is, as a therapist, you are going to say, I believe in the client and what they're going to do, right? They're going to talk it all out and you're going to say, you know, oh yeah, it sounds like you know what you're doing, but obviously a little bit more sophisticated than that. It talks about freedom, about choice, values, personal responsibility, autonomy, which is basically knowing how to uh, make your own decisions and how to operate on your own, <clears throat> purpose, and then also meaning as well. They're also similar because they both place little value on techniques and both focus on genuine encounters. So what that basically means is that you're going to be honest with your client. Your client is going to be honest with themselves. That you're not necessarily saying anything fake or saying things that you don't believe with your client, but really to make it sure that everyone is truthful and honest so that we can really have a, 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 a honest, you know, open conversation. They're different because in humanistic, which is person-centered, less anxiety-evoking position and more optimistic view. So you really do believe that things are good, um, that we're trying to get to that, whereas the existentialist might focus more on the sadder parts of life, which is death, anxiety, depression, and isolation, right? And you can see how those things can light a fire underneath your butt so that you can start moving along, right? But the other way for a person-centered is, oh, you know what, life is, you know, can be good. It probably is good, but we just need to reach to that place where you want to be when it comes to your definition of that. Along with Carl Rogers is Abraham Maslow, and probably one of the most famous when it comes to con contributing to the humanistic psychology that we're talking about right now. Rogers' positive aspects of being human are built on Maslow's theories of self-actualization. So remember we talked about like trying to be who you really want to be uh, in your life. It's a uh, part of positive psychology and compared self-actualizing people to normal individuals. So let's talk about that. Being self-aware, freedom, basic honesty, caring, trust, and autonomy. That's what we already talked about before. Um, but you also want to welcome uncertainty into your lives. So again, that means change, right? New stuff into your life. Acceptance of yourself and others. Spontaneity and creativity. So spontaneity is basically kind of like not everything should be pre-planned and, and, you know, in uh, already everything is decided. No, instead, maybe you're going to be a little bit spontaneous or, you know, um, just doing things, you know, at the, at the last moment. Need for privacy and solitude. So we do need to be private. We need to be alone to think about stuff as well. If solitude is not necessarily loneliness, okay? Capacity for deep and intense interpersonal relationships. So it's talking about being vulnerable with each other, being honest with each other and ourselves. Inner directedness, and then of course having a good sense of humor. When it comes to 
Laszlo's Hierarchy of Needs. This is probably what you have seen in the slide, uh, where basically the base or the bottom obviously is Wi-Fi as a joke, right? Uh, in in you know in in our modern days, but the real one is physiological needs. So physiological need is basically the base. And what it's saying is that you need to have this before you can go to the next level. So physiological needs are things for survival, such as air, shelter, water, and food, right? You need to have that or you cannot have anything above you because you're too worried about those things that are going to keep you alive, right? So you need to be alive by having these things or you cannot go to the next one. The next one is safety and security or safety needs. And so once you have food, once you have, you know, clean water uh, and all that stuff, then now you can find a place to live. And that way, safety and security, right? Being somewhere where you're not going to get injured. And once that happens, then you have the third level, which is belonging and love, which is social needs, such as having friends and family. Is that true? If you cannot feed yourself, obviously, can you really make friends? No. And then also having a place to stay and live will also allow you to be comfortable enough to start to have relationships with other people. The fourth uh, level would be need for esteem. So that would be confidence and achievement and stuff like that. And then the fifth level, which is the highest tier, is self-actualization. So that is basically, you know, learning how to uh, be who you are with when everything is there for you, when your life is good, when your life is safe and all those things, what are you trying to do? What is the biggest thing about yourself, your goals that you have? All right, key concepts, view of human nature. One common theme that is known for person-centered is like a plant, right, growing. So um, like an acorn is seed, once you plant it and then you give it sunlight, if you give it water, all those things that we were talking about in the previous one, the bottom part, the, you know, clean water, clean air, uh, and light and stuff like that, then you're able to then start to grow. And you can grow in any direction that you want. It's up to you, right? Um, how you take all the stuff that's feeding you and, and nurturing you, and then you decide where you're going to grow or how you're going to grow. Basic sense of uh, trust in the client's ability to move forward in a constructive manner. So you really do believe that your client will be able to choose the best thing for that person. There are three therapist attributes that are really well known and person-centered. Uh, they are congruence, unconditional positive regard, and accurate empathetic understanding. So let's go really quickly here and then we'll review it again in a little bit in the rest of the chapter. But congruence means genuineness. Genuineness, another word is to be honest, right? And then unconditional positive regard is accepting or acceptance and caring. So welcoming this person in, right? We're not saying that we accept all the horrible things that they might have done in the previous, you know, before they came here. But by the fact that you're, they're coming into therapy because they are signaling that they would like to change for the better or to find healthier ways of living and making decisions. So that's why you would want to welcome them in so that they feel that way, feel safe, so that they can start doing this. The third part is accurate empathetic understanding. Empathy is a word. It's ability to grasp the subjective world of another. So as a therapist, you're going to be listening to them talk about their lives. And you're going to have to understand where they're coming from so that you can understand their emotions and their feelings about it, right? Where their mind is going. So you need to be able to kind of like step into their shoes and understand why they have been making the decisions that they have been making so far and what are the decisions and changes that they want to do in the future and go, okay, I get why you would want to do that now, right? Clients will be less defensive and more open when you have these three things. And it's very, very true. And actually, I would say that and many people would say this, which is that you need to have all three of these things for all therapeutic frameworks. Um, he is considered very foundational in that sense. Like, you know, we all understand where Carl Rogers is coming from when he says this in the modern day when it comes to therapy. Actualizing tendency, which we've heard before, is striving towards realization. So trying to get to where you want to be at the end to be fulfilled to be autonomous, and also uh, that self-determination that we've been talking about so far. All right, the therapeutic goals and therapeutic processes, achieving a greater degree of independence and integration. So, you know, becoming less needy on other people or needing of other people, 
focus on the person, not the presenting problem. So we really want to look at them as a whole, right? As a person, not just the problem themselves, because once they have made these changes, they're going to also, it's going to also affect their emotions, their behaviors, all those other things, you know, that, that uh, make them a person. Not to merely solve problems and assist clients in their growth process so clients can better co uh, cope with problems as they identify them. Clients will realize that they have lost contact with themselves by using facade. So facade is just a really fancy French word for basically kind of like how you present yourself to the world, kind of like a mask, right? So oftentimes we tell people, oh yeah, we're fine, everything is good, but inside we're not necessarily honest with ourselves, right? And so what happens is when you do that so much that you're telling everyone you're happy, you think you're happy, but then at the same time inside you, you know that there's something wrong, right? And so what he's trying to do is try to get you to move away from all of that. Now let's talk about the therapist's function and role. Rooted in the way of being an attitude, so we do really need to see how you're going to behave there, which is about uh, being positive, being supportive, being congruent, all those other things that we were talking about before. Therapists uses themselves as an instrument of change. Their role is to be without roles. Yeah, you're going to be there to, to kind of talk to your client, right? Um, but you're not necessarily going to do anything that's going to force them to do anything that you think they should do. It's really about listening to them and supporting them in the decisions that they're making. Their role is to be without roles. Do not be overly reliant on contracts because these contracts prevent them from being over-involved, which then makes them under-involved. So what that is also saying is, uh, don't try to find a final destination. It's, remember, it's process-based as well. So let them experience all those things. And as they go, they might even go further than what they think they need to be, right? Or where they need to be. So it is really important to not necessarily go, oh yeah, you finally got here, or you finally got this decision. We're done. We're, we can move on. No, instead, hopefully this will allow them to kind of go more than what they uh, initially thought that they needed to. Be present. That means being in the here and now and accessible to your client, which means that, you know, they should be able to talk to you comfortably and openly and honestly. Focus on their immediate experience. So again, being congruent, being accepting and being empathetic will hopefully allow them to be very, very present with you. Uh, it creates a catalyst for change. Catalyst is just a fun, uh, fancy word for basically getting things started, right? So it's like a chemistry word, like what starts a reaction. So it creates a reaction or a catalyst for change is by being honest, uh, being uh, accepting and being empathetic. Does not view people as diagnostic categories. So we don't necessarily look at all the pathologies, the unhealthiness part. We're looking to see where they're trying to go. Now let's talk about the client's experience in therapy. When a therapist creates an environment that encourages self-exploration, allows the client to explore the full range of experiences such as our feelings, our beliefs, our behaviors, and the world views. So what that means is by being honest and open and, and caring for your client, we're hoping that then they can now start to really open up. And when as they open up, they're going to really talk about all the feelings that they have been feeling and then allow them to be vulnerable and then also talk it all out so that when they do these changes, they understand why. Incongruence would be the opposite of congruence, and that would mean that you are not being honest with yourself. Look at this uh, example right here, Leon. He is a college student. He sees himself as going to become a doctor. That is his self-concept or his ideal concept of who he is. But his grades are below average, so that means that he's probably not going to get accepted into medical school. So then, because of that, then he becomes very anxious or have anxiety, and then he needs to you know, go to therapy, right? So what can we think about when it comes to Leon here? Distortions are less and the clients move to acceptance of conflicting and confusing feelings. So um, right here, he needs to start to realize what's going on, okay? Uh, the less defensive once the client feels that he or she is understood, less concern about meeting other people's expectations. So maybe the becoming a doctor or something in society or his parents or his family or whatever have really put upon him. It's not really his thing. So he needs to be true to himself. Appreciate themselves more, become flexible and creative, less bound by the past, freer to make decisions, and then trusting themselves to manage their own lives. So hopefully Leon will be able to understand who he is as a person um, and understand what his abilities are and then work with those things instead. Because maybe there are other reasons why he had that goal when really he's not doing very well in the school or studying those subjects, right? So then what do we need to do? 
The clients are to create their own self-growth, to be active self-healers. So whenever there is something sad or bad happening in their lives, that they know how to also fix those things themselves. Therapists are a place where self-healing is activated. So basically what that's saying is you're going to be part of that, the water, the sunlight, uh, you know, the, the, the fertilized ground, the richness, the food that helps your client learn how to grow themselves. A place for practicing new behaviors is in therapy and then exploring their feelings as well. All right, this is the end of the first section. Bye.